This is the first in a series of lectures on imaging of deep neck infections. The clinicians are particularly interested in several items when they order an examination of the neck to assess for infection. The most important things that the radiologist needs to comment upon are the source of infection, the presence or absence of abscess because that determines whether the patient will go to surgery or not, the extent of the disease which determines how much surgery the patient gets, and of course complications of deep space infections which we'll talk about in detail. So let's start with sources of infection. It's important to identify sources of infection because if you don't deal with the source of the infection, then even if you treat the infection, it will return at a later date. The most common source of infection in adults, by far, is the teeth. In children, it's a little different. Here, the tonsils are going to be the most common source of infection. But there are other so potential sources of infection, including the salivary glands, the temporal bones, and a variety of other sources such as lymph nodes, retained foreign bodies, prior trauma, or superinfection of existing underlying structures. This is a patient with swelling of the left face, and this is the classic presentation for an abscess within the facial soft tissues. You can see you can see that there is a rim enhancing collection in the upper lip, but the source of the infection is not immediately obvious. When we switch to bone windows, we can identify the source of infection. You can see that this is a tooth that previously had a root canal and has developed extensive periodontal disease with an apical abscess. And you can see, just vaguely in the background, this is exactly the location where the abscess has arisen in the upper lip. So it's important to identify which tooth is responsible for the infection. Here's another situation where we have an abscess, this time on the lingual surface of the mandible, whereas last time it was on the buccal surface. Here we are on the lingual surface of the mandible, and you can see that there is a small amount of gas within this abscess indicating anaerobic infection. You can see extensive inflammation of the surrounding soft tissues, and in fact this abscess runs along the entire lingual surface of the body of the mandible. But what's the source of this infection? Well, once again, we need to switch to our bone windows. On the bone windows, we can see that there is a large cavity in this third molar wisdom tooth of the mandible, and you can even see a small focus of cortical breakthrough from the apex of this tooth out into the soft tissues. So here, the wisdom tooth of the right mandible is the source of infection. This drawing summarizes the different directions of spread for the teeth. We've talked about how this is the most common source of infection in adults, and you can see from this diagram just how the teeth can infect all different parts of the face and down into the neck. So a maxillary tooth can extend up into the paranasal sinuses. This is often an unrecognized source of sinusitis, that is odontogenic sinusitis, very important source of sinusitis. Infection can instead extend through the buccal surface of the maxilla and out into the infratemporal fossa. From the mandibular teeth, infection can spread laterally into the buccal space. This is the buccinator muscle here. This is the buccal space. It can e extend inferiorly down into the upper neck. Here, this is the salivary glands, for example. Or it can spread medially into the floor of mouth. Now, the distinction between whether something spreads into the neck or into the floor of mouth depends on which tooth is the source of infection. This is a drawing of the inner surface of the mandible. It's like you're inside the mouth looking at the inside of 
this half of the jaw. You can see the mandibular foramen here and the condyle and coronoid process there. The purpose of this drawing is to show how different types of teeth spread infection to different areas in the floor of mouth or in the upper neck. This gray line is the mylohyoid line where the mylohyoid muscle attaches along the inner surface of the mandible. The anterior teeth, by which I mean the first molar on forward, the anterior teeth have roots that extend only down to the floor of mouth, above the mylohyoid line. So when infection from the anterior teeth breaks through the lingual surface, the lingual cortex of the mandible, the infection ends up here in the floor of mouth. However, for posterior teeth, by which I mean the second and third molars, here the roots extend below the mylohyoid line. So if you have an apical abscess and it breaks through the cortex, it will end up in the upper neck, below the, the mylohyoid line in the upper neck, and your infection will be somewhere around the submandibular glands. Uh, moving away from the teeth, now let's talk about other sources of infection. Here's an example of, uh, of an infection arising within the tonsils, which, we, as we said earlier, is the most common site of infection in children. This image depicts an acute tonsillitis. You can see the characteristic serpentine pattern of enhancement throughout the tonsils themselves. This is sometimes called a tiger stripe or zebra stripe or serpentine pattern of enhancement. Surely some animal will work for you. Now, this is not something that we commonly see in patients with peritonsillar abscess. This is the findings for acute tonsillitis. In order to understand this pattern and to understand some of the complications of tonsillitis, we need to understand a little bit about the anatomy of the tonsil. The tonsil is composed of mucosa that extends deep into crypts within the tonsil and then extends back out again. So this enhancement pattern that we're seeing is actually enhancement of these deep, these mucosa-lined deep crypts interspersed with areas of edematous parenchyma. What this means is that no matter where you are in the tonsils, you're always pretty close to a mucosal surface. We'll come back to that concept when we talk about peritonsillar abscesses. But for now, this is the appearance of an acute tonsillitis. Here's another potential source of infection. The salivary glands themselves can be either involved secondarily from an infection nearby or can be a primary source of infection. This is particularly the case when the gland is obstructed, as with a calculus, but can also be direct infection of the gland, as from a viral infection. The best known viral infection of the submandibular glands and parotid glands is mumps. You can see in this case that the involved submandibular gland is enlarged, there's abnormal enhancement, there's thickening of the overlying platysma muscle, and there's infiltration of the surrounding fat. That helps us to distinguish this as an infection rather than a tumor of the gland. Here's another example of a salivary infection. Here you can see the obstructing stone along the expected course of Stenson's duct. And you can see that behind the stone, Stenson's duct has enlarged and there's an enhancing rim and it has become abscessed. So we have an abscess of Stenson's duct. We have an extensive peritonitis that results and it's all the fault of this obstructing stone. This ends part one of the lecture on infections. We will continue with sources of infection in part two.